Well, thanks, Brother Matt, for reading that. If you can, please keep your place there in, in Luke chapter 3. But first, if you can please turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. And I just want to read from uh, verse 3. It says there, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. So here we have a famous prophecy about John the Baptist, how John the Baptist will come and prepare the way for the Lord and make his paths straight. And have a look in verse 4. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight. The title of my sermon is The Crooked Shall Be Made Straight. And in this sermon, I want to look at this idea of how God is going to make everything that's crooked straight. And sometimes God will use uh, man to make some things which are crooked straight and some things God himself has to make straight because we can't straighten them out. So we're just going to look at how God will make everything crooked one day straight. And crooked means something that's twisted or bent out of shape or you could say something that's not straight. And these things God will one day make straight. And that's the great hope we have as believers because we live in a world that's crooked. We live in a body that's crooked and we have great hope knowing that one day everything is going to be made straight by the Lord. So we've got our physical ailments, our afflictions in this life. We look at what's going on in the world and we can realise like, this is crooked. This is not right. But we know the Lord's going to make all things crooked straight. Now, the lost, they don't have that hope. Like, they, they live in a crooked world. They live in a, a fallen body and they're suffering. But they have no hope beyond what's happening in this world. Like Ephesians 2 says that they are without hope and without God. Like, that's depressing. That's depressing. You've got no hope and you're without God. So what you're experiencing now, it's not going to get any better for the lost unless they get saved. But for us, what we're experiencing now, look, it's not going to get any, any worse than what it is now. Like what we experience now is very temporary and we know we have this hope that all things are going to be straightened out by God. So we can suffer light afflictions now for a moment knowing, look, this is just very temporary and we have great hope and great confidence in God as believers, knowing that any suffering, any crooked ways that we have to endure now is just very, very temporary. So if you can now turn back to, we'll keep your place there, uh, you already got your place there in Luke, chapter 3, and let's have a look at John the Baptist. So we want to look at how God used John the Baptist to make some crooked things straight in his day. All right, so there, you're there in Luke chapter 3. Have a look at verse 4. And it says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, which we just read that in Isaiah chapter 40, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So in John the Baptist's day, the paths of the Lord had been made crooked in the way the, um, the religious people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, how they went about the service to God was, was crooked. They had corrupted uh, the way that God would have things run, spiritually speaking, in that time. And John the Baptist's job was to come and straighten out those things and preach against the corruption in his day to prepare the people to believe on Jesus Christ when he eventually came. Let's keep reading, verse 5. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough way shall be made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. If you can turn to Mark chapter 1. So we can see there that, that Israel was in a pretty bad state when John the Baptist arrived on, on the scene. And it had been many decades, many centuries, like 300, maybe 400 years before or since they had heard a word from God, before they had heard a, a prophet speak. And let's just have a look at, um, well, I'll read it to you from Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. This is the last time God had spoken to Israel when John the Baptist was on the scene. It says there in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now we know that in part this is speaking of John the Baptist because the people said to Jesus, well, why did the scribes say that 
uh, Elijah must come first. And, and Jesus said, well, he, he did come first and they did to him whatever they wanted. And then they realised, oh, he's speaking about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist did fulfil, at least in part, this prophecy about, um, from Malachi. And it says there that he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So that's an interesting verse there where it says, turn their hearts for the children to the fathers. So the spiritual fathers were like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And we know that these people walked in the, the true, the straight ways of God, so to speak. They were faithful men filled with the Holy Spirit and that obeyed God. But now the children in John the Baptist day, well, they're not like their fathers. And part of John the Baptist's preaching was to turn the fathers back to following the, the ways of, of the children, back to following the ways of their fathers and walking in truth. So this is part of his job. Otherwise, when Jesus arrived, he may just smite the earth with a curse. So John the Baptist needed to come first and prepare the way. And John the Baptist was very successful. He was very successful at preaching. And for a while there, he did turn the tide and did straighten out the ways of God. So have a look at Mark chapter 1, verse 5. And this is look how effective uh, John the Baptist was. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptised of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. So we see there that all the land of Judea went out to him and they of Jerusalem. So this is no small revival, so to speak. All the land of Judea are going out to him as multitudes going out into the wilderness to hear John. And probably no wonder, because there's like been 300 years, 400 years where there's been no prophet. And word gets around, there's a prophet again preaching. And the common folk, they go out to, to see him and, they, and they're accepting what he's, what he's preaching. But what was he preaching? What was John the Baptist preaching, which turned the tide, which straightened out the ways of the Lord? Well, just turn to John chapter 1. Let's have a look at what John the Baptist was preaching. And of course, he's known as being a repentance preacher. But what was he preaching out in the wilderness? What does John chapter 1 verse 6? It says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that light that all men through him might believe. So John was preaching to bear, bearing witness of the light that all, through, all men through him might believe. Okay, believe what? Well, let me read to you from Acts 19 verse 8. Then said Paul... John verily baptised with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So John the Baptist, he was preaching about Jesus, that people need to believe in Jesus. And that's what his message was. And he, he was effective. Like I said, he was effective and people did respond. Let's, let's have a look at uh, verse 7, Luke chapter 3, verse 7. Let's keep going through, through Luke for a little bit longer. Luke chapter 3 verse 7 says, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptised of him, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So he's preaching a, a pretty hard message. And these are the people coming out to meet him, to, to hear his preaching. And what's he saying to them? He's saying, you generation of vipers. This is what he's saying to the multitudes coming out of Judea and Jerusalem to hear him preach. He's calling them a generation of vipers. So he's preaching hard against these people. And, and keep reading verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So here we see what the problem is, what they needed to repent of. The children of Israel, they, they believed they were God's people, they were righteous, and they weren't sinners, and they were better than the other nations because they were the seed of Abraham. Because according to the flesh, they had, part, they had descended from Abraham. And that's what their confidence was in. Now, their confidence was in just their, their natural genealogy. And John the Baptist was coming to say, you need to repent of that. And how do, you, how do we know if they did repent of that? Well, it says there, back in, I read to you from Mark 1 verse 5, that they came confessing their sins. So they come and confess, well, we are actually sinners. We're not righteous just because we descend from Abraham. We're sinners and they're confessing their sins, showing that they are turning away from trusting in their good works or trusting in their genealogies as being right with God. Now, let's keep reading in verse 33. Uh, no, sorry, verse... 
Well, no, I'll just read to you from John. You stay there in Luke. I'll read to you from John chapter 8 and verse 33. And this idea of the Jews trusting in the genealogy, this is, this is something that Jesus also confronted with them as well. You, you might remember that he, he had the same issue with these guys. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So he's trying to say, look, if you've committed a sin, well, you're a servant of sin. It doesn't matter if you descend from Abraham or not. You're a sinner if you've committed a sin. And they just weren't getting it. And I'll just jump down to verse 44. And Jesus just cuts to the chase. And he says, look, you are of your father, the devil. So he's preaching hard against these Jews, which won't repent of trusting in their genealogy as causing them to be right with God. And he just cuts to the chase, look, you're not of Abraham, you're of your father, the devil. Okay, so Jesus was a hard preacher, just like John the Baptist was. And John the Baptist, he was calling these people a generation of vipers. And back to Luke chapter 3, verse 9, it says there, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therewith which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So John the Baptist, like he preached that you had to believe in Jesus. And he's also preaching against false religion. And he's swinging the axe. When he's preaching, he's swinging that axe and he's chopping into all their false beliefs and religions that they're trusting in. So he's not afraid to call them vipers and swing the axe and expose what they're trusting in, which is not of Christ. And when we go solving, that's what we're doing, aren't we? Like we're swinging that axe. Like we're preaching about Jesus, so you need to believe in Jesus, and also we're swinging the axe and we're chopping off their good works, their Catholicism, or, or I'm going to go to heaven because my, my parents are missionaries or pastors. Or, and don't, we, we see that, don't we? When you're speaking to people and they go, we say to them, well, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Oh, my, my parents are pastors. Yeah. Oh, okay, they're not, sorry. But no, we need to swing that axe and say, look, that's not good enough. And these people here, they were saying, oh, we're, we're right, thanks, John. Well, we're right, thanks, Jesus, because our, our father is Abraham. And Jesus saying, no, your father is the devil. And he's swinging the axe. And when we go soul winning, we do have to swing that axe when we need to. And say, look, just because you're a Catholic, just because you're, you're baptized, just because you're a good person, it doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. So we need to be like John the Baptist, preach Jesus, and swing the axe as well. And this, this hard preaching from John is making a difference. So we see these multitudes are listening and they're getting, they're getting ready to believe on Jesus when he arrives. And look at Luke chapter 3, verse 15. It says, And as the people were in expectation and all men mused in the hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. So people are looking at John's fiery, powerful preaching and they're wondering, well, maybe this is the Christ because he's so powerful at, at his preaching. And then uh, verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptise you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will freely purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, and the chaff he will burn with unquench fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preach he unto the people. So we can see here John the Baptist is powerfully preaching about Jesus. And, and Jesus, he, he does put you in two camps. When we go soul winning and we're preaching to people, we're saying, look, you're either going to be put into Jesus' garner as wheat and you're going to go to heaven or you're going to be burned with unquenchable fire. And that's the two choices that people have. And we want to present those choices to them clearly. We don't want them to be vague or unsure of what, it, what the consequences are. So when people reject Jesus, we want to tell them, look, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to be thrown into the fire, which is unquenchable in hell. So we want to be clear on the, our gospel presentation. And John the Baptist, like, he made a, a great difference in his day. And look, it goes to show what, what, man, what one man can do who's filled with the Holy Ghost, who's consecrated unto God and has the words of God hidden in his heart. Look, that man can make a big difference. Imagine, look, if all of us were like John the Baptists, 
going out soul winning. If every saved person, or every church that had the true gospel, the true word of God, if they were like a John the Baptist church in Australia, like what difference could we make? We could save some multitudes. We could see some people saved. Uh, but I do personally believe that for Australia as, as a whole, it's too late. It's too late for Australia to escape God's judgment. And that we can see some saved. If we go out there in the spirit of God, like John the Baptist, and preaching the truth, preaching, swinging the axe, preaching the truth about Jesus, like we can see some multitude saved on the way. Like we're responsible for the Sunshine Coast, aren't we? So if Sunshine Coast gets judged by God, well, it's not going to be because we didn't do anything. We're going to at least make sure that the Sunshine Coast in Australia hears the gospel. We'll, we'll go out there like John the Baptist preaching the word of God. And we can at least see some say, I do believe Australia, it's too late. So if you can turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And we, we can be encouraged by John the Baptist because he was one man against a, a religious nation who caused multitudes of people to believe in Jesus. And he did prepare the way for the Lord. He did straighten out some of the, the, um, the crooked ways in his day, and he was just one man. And what are, what are we here? Like, we've got dozens of people here who can be John the Baptist on the Sunshine Coast, and we can see God, see the, we can see the multitude saved by, by the power of God. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12 says, chapter 1, verse 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail have God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. So I would apply that to Australia. I would say Australia is crooked and it cannot be made straight. Like we cannot make Australia straight only god can only god can so what what should we do now though in light of this in light of australia it's probably waiting for god's judgment so what should we do now while we wait well the first point is we should shine as lights in, in this world if you can turn to philippians chapter 2 verse 14 even though it's too late for australia to turn back and be a righteous nation maybe in the 70s and the 80s, like it wasn't too late, but I think definitely now it, it's too late for Australia. But what we should do about it is at least shine as lights. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So we are in a perverse and crooked nation in Australia. Like think of what Australia has, what it, what it celebrates, like the like gay pride, like something which is an abomination to God, which has a death penalty, which is something that Israel, when they were walking with God, they threw out all the Sodomites out of land, burned down their buildings and their houses, but now we celebrate them. It's even written in law that Sodomites and lesbians can actually get married, and it's something that the nation gets behind and has a whole parade and celebrates it. Look, that's, that's a wicked thing for a nation to do. Think of all the, all the babies which this nation murders and the government has legalised the murder of babies. And what else has it done? Like all the injustices which are done in our nation. Like what Brother Sam was talking about, the, um, the no-cause divorce which came in the 70s, making it easy for... Uh, anyone to put away their husband or their wife. So Australia is a wicked nation and it's getting worse and worse and worse. But what we should be doing is shining as lights. Despite all this which is going on, we should shine as lights. What did Jesus say about John the Baptist? He said John was a burning and shining light in his generation and he made a big difference. So we can be a burning and shining light in our generation and still save some and still see some multitudes saved. Like people will still respond to bold preaching. People still will listen to the gospel. We do see people saved. And verse 16, how do we be shining lights? Well, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither laboured in vain. So we need to hold on to the word of life and not let go of it and preach it like John the Baptist preached it and we, need, and we swing that axe. We shouldn't be afraid to rebuke the wickedness in our nation and we swing that axe 
and we, we chop down those false things that people are trusting in, those false religions, trusting in people's wealth and, and good works and all those sort of things, we shouldn't be uh, afraid to swing that axe, to swing the sword. Now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. And Moses, he was another hard preacher that wasn't afraid to, to swing the axe and to preach God's word to his wicked generation. So Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 1 This is Moses talking here, and I just love the, the, the language of the King James Bible. It says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Have a listen to this. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. So our job, like, like Moses, we need to drop our doctrine like the rain upon the Sunshine Coast in Australia. Now I think that's amazing, a good language there in the King James Bible. And we want to publish the gospel in our land. That's, that's how we respond. That's how we be shining lights to the wicked nation of Australia. We're going to publish the word of God. We're going to let doctrine of the gospel drop like, like rain upon the ground let's get reading he is the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are judgment a god of truth without iniquity just and right is he they have corrupted themselves their spot is not the spot of his children they are a perverse and crooked generation so moses just like john the baptist just like us today he was faced with a crooked generation a crooked nation but still he's still preaching the gospel he doesn't give up he doesn't go and and hide in, in the wilderness or, or in the bunker in the, in the desert he's out there preaching the gospel he's still he's still preaching god's words preaching the doctrine of god despite all the wickedness of, of the land and that's the same as what we need to be doing we make the crooked way straight at least in part by preaching the word of god by swinging that axe and being bright and shining lights so Many Christians today, well, they're not looking for Jesus to return and straighten out Australia. They're still, they're still looking for what the right prime minister will come in, a Christian prime minister will come in, and some are believing there's going to be a nationwide revival that's going to sweep through the nation and turn Australia back to God. But look, these things aren't going to happen. Like what we're looking forward to is the return of Jesus Christ. That's the next big event that we're looking forward to. And if you can turn to Isaiah chapter 65... Isaiah chapter 65. So we know, look, it's not going to happen. Look, the only revival that's going to happen is when we go out there in the power of Elijah, the power of, of John the Baptist, and the power of the Holy Ghost, preaching the word of God. And we're going to see multitudes saved if we do that. That's what, the, that's what the churches in Australia need to be doing, is preaching the gospel and not just staying indoors, praying for God to do some magical revival that's going to fix everything. What's going to fix everything, we're going to look at some verses soon, is when Jesus returns and, and straightens out the crooked ways in Australia. While you turn into Isaiah chapter 65, I'll just read to you from Isaiah 64 verse 1. And this needs to be our cry regarding Australia. It says, All that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil to make thy name known to thy adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. At the moment, the nation of Australia, it's not trembling at the word of God, at the presence of God. But one time, one, one, time, one day soon, when the Lord rends the heavens and returns, look, they will be trembling at the presence of God. They are going to tremble at God's presence. And you know, we have a part to play in this. If you're a believer today, you have a part to play in God straightening out Australia. So Isaiah 65 and verse 9, Isaiah 65 and verse 9 says, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, well you could say out of Australia, it still would apply to Australia, and out of Judah, and inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. One day when the Lord returns, the, the faithful believers will inherit land. So at the moment, it's run by wicked people, uh, bringing in wicked laws and celebrating abominations, all that sort of thing. But one day when the Lord returns, like the righteous will inherit the land. And we know that Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. 
And the meek is just the humble people. Like the Bible says, and I think it's in Peter, if you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you in due time. So the believers will be exalted in due time and rule over the nations. And look, maybe if you've, if you've done too well as a believer and you have too many rewards, you might just be ruling with Jesus over in uh, Jerusalem or Israel. But maybe if you didn't go so good, you might get Australia or the Sunshine Coast or Sydney or, or Nambour to, to rule over. So, but at the end of the day, the righteous will inherit the land. And that's what we have to look, we have to look forward to. And then like God will straighten out the, the crooked ways in Australia when he returns and gives Australia to the righteous as rewards. But it's going to get exciting now. What about the wicked that remain in the land when this, when this happens? What about the wicked? Let's have a look at verse 11. Isaiah 65, verse 11. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because, well, why? When I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. So they rejected the soul winner. God sent the soul winner and called unto them to be saved. They rejected the soul winner, and they've delighted in that which God hates. So maybe the Sodomites, maybe murder, maybe all manner of wickedness that people have chosen instead of believing the gospel. And what is the, the end result with these, these people? That they will, I will number you to the sword and you shall all bow down to the slaughter. That's what's going to happen to the wicked people in our nation which uh, are doing all these wicked things and reject the soul winner. It says there, I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil. So we went, God sent soul winners to their door, knocked on their door, we published the gospel, we did all that we could that was what we're going to do as New Life Baptist Church. We're doing all that we can do to save some, but people are, going, are not going to listen to that and they get will punished, will be punished um, by God and they'll give them to the slaughter. Let's keep reading, verse 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for the joy of heart. Well, maybe because your crooked ways have been straightened out by that point, so we're joyful. But ye shall cry for sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. So we're going to see there that we're going to be rejoicing in that day. And they, they will be weeping and howling and getting their, their punishment from God, getting God's wrath poured out upon them. But at the same time, we'll be rejoicing. We will inherit the land. That's the future of Australia. So you could say Australia has a pretty bright future. <laughs> when Jesus returns, it's bright for us, but, but it's going to be wrath for the wicked. Okay, and that should give us hope. That should give us joy, knowing that the wickedness that we see going on, and now it's grievous to us, like it vexes our soul. But we know one day Jesus will return and straighten out the crooked ways of Australia. Uh, Isaiah 65 verse 16. So Australia will be a righteous nation one day. That he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten because they are hid from mine eyes. Like right now, we have troubles. We have crooked ways. We have things which are twisted out of shape, which are bent out of shape in our lives, which cause us troubles. But do you, you know one day you're going to not even remember those troubles? The things that are on your mind now that you're troubled about, like one day, like you're going to forget all about them. So we need to remember that. Like we, we worry about these things now, but one day it's going to be something we can't even remember because our our crooked ways will be made straight. So what else should we do while we wait for God to return and, and sort out Australia? Well, we've talked about being a bright and shining light. It's something else that we can do. Uh, if you turn to Psalms 5, turn to Psalm 5, and verse 7, and there's something else that we can do. So we're shining as lights, we're preaching the word, 
we're swinging that axe, we're proclaiming what the Word of God says about the future of Australia, and we're trying to save some, we're trying to pluck as many people out of the fire as we can, but what else can we do? Psalm 5 verse 7 says, But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship towards thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine iniquities. Make thy way straight before my face. So what we can do, we can straighten out the crooked ways in our life. And what I mean by that is that where we've been worldly or we're allowing sin into our lives, they're crooked ways which we shouldn't allow in our lives. So we can straighten out those crooked ways now. So we can focus on ourselves and, and repent of these sins and then get God to straighten out these crooked ways. This is what David was saying. When I come into the house of God, I want to have a straight way before, before me. We want to make sure we straighten out the crooked ways in our own life because we can do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Hebrews 12 verse 12 says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed. So we need to straighten out our own ways. We want to make a straight path for our own feet. Okay, so we, that's what we need to do. We have the power from God to straighten out our own crooked ways. Like there's certain things that we can't straighten out in Australia, which Jesus will take care of, but there's certain things we can straighten out in our own lives as far as walking in, in righteousness and holiness. We can straighten out these ways. And also, as well as straightening out our own ways and being shining light, something else that we can do now is have patience. Is have patience. So if you can turn to Romans chapter 8, like God really is teaching his children to have patience. Especially when we see just the wicked things going on in the world and on the news and social media. Like it's just like so many terrible things which are happening in the world. It's almost like, Lord, how long? How long are you going to wait before you return and just judge this wickedness? But he's causing us to have, have patience right now and just keep being faithful, keep preaching the gospel, keep walking in a straight way in their own lives. And have a look at Romans 8 verse 22. Romans 8 verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only lay, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. So in this body, it's crooked, it's bent out of shape, it's twisted, isn't it? And we're suffering, there's this affliction by being in this flesh, like... Like, spiritually speaking, we're struggling with sin in this flesh and there's aches and pains. Like, yesterday, I had a game of squash, my first game of squash for 15 years. And I thought, look, it'll be just like it was when I was 30. I'll play squash and it'll be all good. But then, at the end of the game, I, like, I had a bit of a sore back. And I thought, well, oh, that's okay. And then I drive home from, from Belgium, where the squash courts were, get home, and I get to hop out of the car and I couldn't stand up. <laughs> like, I literally couldn't stand up. And oh man, and then I've been struggling ever since, but, God, but God's been good and it's getting better and better, but man, that was, that's an affliction. Like, that's, that's a crooked way, you know? And man, it started with groaning within myself, like literally groaning within myself. Well, that's a good al- illustration for the sermon. So God works all things to good, doesn't he? For those that love God, so that was a blessing. But man, like, we, we groan within ourselves, don't we? And we're having patience. But the good thing is, um, in verse 24 says, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he get hope for it? But we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for us. I, I know I'm going to have a new body. Look, I'm not too worried about what happens to this body because I know I'm going to have a new one. Look, it's something that like, I'm convinced of. I, I know in my heart. So look, I'm not too worried about aches and pains and problems and things like that because I know it's so temporary, okay, so temporary. And we need to have patience while we wait for it. But if we have hope for that which we see, not, then we do with patience wait for it. So God's wanting us to have patience and, and just wait a little bit longer. And one day we're going to be rewarded when we see the Lord return and make all the crooked ways straight. Have a look at Isaiah 42 and verse 13. Just a short sermon for you this afternoon. And let's finish on a positive note. Let's finish on, on something that's going to be uplifting, that's going to give you some encouragement to, to keep on being patient, to keep on 
preaching the gospel and keep on swinging that axe as we go soul winning and keep on just living that clean, straight life. Let's have a look here what the Lord says in Isaiah 42 and verse 13. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealously like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. And this is God speaking. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. So that's what God's doing now. He's holding still. He's refraining himself. He's holding his peace. Because we see all these wicked things happening. And like, God, you know, when are you going to step in and do something? And it says here, I have a long time holding my peace. I've refrained myself. But now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. Like the Lord's going, when he does step in, he's going to be wild. He's going to be like a travailing woman and he's going to destroy and devour at once. Like God is going to bring the hammer down. He's going to swing the axe. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs and I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. Man, so God's going to really bring down the wrath. Like he's just seen this pile of wrath is building up, building up, building up, and one day it's all going to come down. And verse 16, And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them, and not forsake them. So we know God's going to make the crooked things straight. One time, every, every, one day, everything that's crooked now, God, rest assured, God's going to make it straight. Now, we should have great hope. We should have great rejoicing, knowing that one day everything that's a problem in our lives, we're going to forget about. We won't even remember them. The things that we think about now, well, one day we won't even think about them at all. So maybe we shouldn't be worried too much about them now. And we should, what should we be doing? We should be preaching the gospel like John the Baptist, who made a big difference in his day. Like multitudes got saved, believed in Jesus, but we know a few decades later, well, they went um, and were punished by God the nation did so it was still um, a perverse generation but we can make a big difference in our generation on the sunshine coast and we can just see god make some crooked ways straight right that's